Excellent! Hey guys, how's it going? And welcome back to Probing Paul. This is episode number 30. This is my monthly Q&A where I answer tech questions or random questions or what have you. I've been doing this for quite some time now. Well, this is the 30th episode. There is a look back at the Probing Paul playlist. So if you want to go back and look at other questions I have responded to, feel free to do so. Today, I have some questions that were posted in last month's video. So leave questions down in the comment section below if you want me to potentially answer them in next month's December episode. But for now, let us begin with the first question. This is from Sawyer. He asks, why are monitor names always so long and hard to remember? So let's double check Sawyer. Uh, we're looking at Newegg and check what some typical monitor names are. The Dell SE2216HV. Hmm, that's catchy. The HP V4G46A8. Uh, Acer ED series. Oh, this has a series, the ED series. ED3T22Q. Now, this is applying to monitors here, but we can actually apply this to pretty much the whole wide range of PC components that you could potentially buy. Now, here is an actual monitor that does have a brand name, the Asus ROG Swift, because Asus has done licensing for these brands. ROG, Republic of Gamers, is a brand that they own. Swift is a series of monitors that they specifically went through the process to create a brand for, pay for the licensing. I don't know the details that go into that, but I know it's an additional process. So the short answer is money. It costs more money to go through the branding process to create a brand that's just a word instead of a string of letters and numbers. The cost involved, the cost of keeping up with that brand and making sure you protect it out in the wild. And then also you have to bear in mind that when it comes to computers, there's lots of smaller companies that uh, develop and manufacture the parts that go inside. And those companies aren't always large enough to absorb the cost that goes into a branding initiative. So they stick with letters and numbers so that they can sell you the products at a minimum margin and keep the price low so that they can be more competitive in that way and apparently this has been a financially reasonable solution for a lot of manufacturers when it comes to the wide range of products that they bring to market because it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Next question here is from Corey W who says, Paul would you suggest buying a second 1070 Ti for an SLI setup or buying a single 1080 Ti for 1440p gaming at a higher refresh rate? I like your resolution sir, I like that you're playing at a higher refresh rate and a 1070 Ti, 1070 Ti is a perfectly adequate card for that. That said, if you're looking for more frames, SLI is a potential solution, but I would recommend that you opt with going for a single faster card rather than adding another 1070 Ti to your setup. However, you should reality check, and to that end, I have linked a review by Babel Tech Reviews in this video's description, which is a 50-game GTX 1070 Ti SLI review. This is from back in January, so it's a little bit dated, but this should give you a better idea of the wide variety of games and the performance you should expect. They tested at 1080, 1440, and 2160, and over on the right side here in the yellow column, you can see the percentage increase in performance they got, or in some cases, negative performance, or in some cases, just like practically nothing, 1.6% to 3.1 percent. This is why we usually recommend people go with a single card versus two card is because there's simply a wide variance in the performance you would expect to see. That said, if you happen to be a huge fan of like three or four games in particular and you look at this chart and you're like wow they all scale really well with SLI then maybe that is a good solution for you. So generally speaking I would say no opt for the fastest single card you can get rather than going with an SLI setup, but in some specific scenarios, if you can see the game that you want to play most, and you can see the performance increase is there in that game, then I would actually say go for it in that situation. Next question from ZipZioLock. I am surprised no one has ever asked this, but do laptops have a UEFI menu like desktop motherboards do? During system boot up on laptop, I've never seen it say, press a certain key to enter a BIOS. And this will vary pretty significantly actually from laptop manufacturer to laptop manufacturer. Laptop manufacturers often uh, produce their own motherboards, but they do all have some means of accessing a pre-boot environment, UEFI typically, and you can often access that by pressing a key on startup. I've seen a bunch of different varieties on it, whether you're talking about like an Acer or an Asus or a, a ThinkPad or something like that. They all have different means. You can usually check your manufacturer guide info, like they might have a PDF guide that you can download from their website or documentation that came with the laptop in order to tell you the specific means for your specific laptop of doing that. It's harder because laptops are usually a lot less amenable to stuff like overclocking or changing settings in there, but it can often be useful. If you can't find your documentation or if you just want an easier way, check out the video I posted just last week about the best way to access your BIOS or UEFI. Just hold the shift button while you go click restart and that will allow you to access the advanced startup menu. And from here, you can just tell it to go ahead and uh, boot to the UEFI firmware settings, which will automatically restart the laptop and boot into that environment. And then you can play around or I, I don't know why you want to access that, but there are reasons 
Well, you might want to, I guess. I'll, I'll leave that to your discretion. Next question here from Chamidu Udagadera. I'm sorry, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but I did my best. But he says, hey, Paul, is it safe to use a blower on a vacuum cleaner to clean off the dust from computer components such as motherboards and laptops? And then, by the way, thank you for making the videos. You're very welcome. Uh, and thank you for the question. The answer is yes, but you should be very careful. There's a couple of reasons why you might not want to use a vacuum. One is that some vacuums, especially if you're in a very dry and static rich environment, can actually move so much air, especially again, if it's dry, hot air, that it can develop static charges that can potentially discharge and damage components. That's a real rare scenario. I haven't seen that actually happen personally. It's just something I've been warned about in the past. The other thing I warn you about is if you have case fans or system fans or CPU fans, any fans that are inside the system, Fans like these have a maximum RPM rate, and if you blast a bunch of high-speed air through them with a vacuum or a blower or something, you can actually over-rotate them to the point where the uh, engine or the motor inside is damaged, and you don't want to do that. You can, of course, prevent that by simply doing something to keep the fan blades from spinning as you blow the air onto them, or uh, if you are cleaning out computers often, you might consider investing in something like a data vac. Um, I don't have one of these personally, but Kyle has one and he swears by it. It's about 70 bucks on Amazon. So I'll link this in the description. Uh, but beyond that, yes, you can use a vacuum. Just again, be careful of those two potential situations that can occur. Oh, I would say one other thing. If you have a vacuum on suck mode and it's a very strong vacuum, there are situations where you can actually suck components off of a PCB. So I would be very careful about going right up against something like that too, because they're not really made to withstand that level of pressure, positive or negative. Next question from Cypunk215. Hey Paul, I understand a lot of PC builders like to show off their gear with a side panel window while hiding the cable clutter on the other side of the case, but lately everyone seems to be mounting their SSDs on the hidden side. Are we ashamed of the SSDs? Are they more ugly than closed loop coolers? And uh, how do you choose which components you want to show off and which you don't? Uh, I've had this situation happen to myself several times because I'll build a system and oftentimes if it's got a power supply shroud, it might have SSD mounts on the top of it and it's a very nice location to drop an SSD. Or you might have a situation like I have with this SL600M that has mounts right here for SSDs uh, with plugs that you put on the back, but where the actual connector is, is a factor here. This connector is actually on the right side with the Samsung drive, so if I mounted it there, the wires would be coming out on the right. But the SanDisk drive I had was actually printed the other way, so if I uh, put it that way, the writing would have been upside down. And that was enough for me to not want to put it there, because I don't want the cables coming out on this side, and I don't want the writing upside down if I have to flip it. So because of that, I moved it to the rear mount. So with that said, the way I decide whether I'm going to display a product in a build prominently so that people can see it through a side panel is usually just how it looks and how it matches with the rest of the system. Uh, this is a Seagate 600 Pro, which you can't get anymore. They discontinued them, but this has like a pretty standard metal surface. And this, I might remove the label from and have in a prominent position if this sort of metal finished matched with the aesthetic of the rest of my build. This Toshiba TR200, we have done some ads for, and it's a very solid performing drive itself. I don't like the sticker on here that much. I mean, if you're going with the green, gray, and black build, then maybe it matches, but anything else, you'd probably want to remove that. Beyond that, though, it does have sort of a a textured finish, so that's not too bad either. But a lot of these are just housings. The actual SSD inside is fairly small, so it's up to the SSD manufacturer whether or not they want to make something that has sort of a, a cleaner finish, like the Samsung 850 Evo here, pretty color neutral. You could put this wherever, and then anyone looking at your system who knows about SSDs or whatever be like, oh, that's a nice SSD. Or you can go completely the aesthetic side and have something like these Team Group SSDs, which have RGB LEDs integrated to them, which you may love or may hate, depending on your love of aesthetics with computers and whether or not you have RGB LEDs. But these, it would be a travesty to purchase and then not place somewhere that were somewhat visible. So you have a whole wide range of SSDs. But I think what I like most about SSDs is just they're very flexible since they're small and thin. And even if you don't have a mount somewhere, you can just get some Velcro adhesive strips and put them on the back and then stick it wherever you want. So SSDs, they're super convenient. Next question from George Norin, and this is a longer one, so I'm gonna to try to paraphrase, but he has a Ryzen 2700 and an ASRock X470 Tai Chi motherboard with two M.2 slots. One is Gen 3 by four, and one is Gen 2 by four, which has significantly less bandwidth. 
He has a WD NVMe 500 gig storage drive and he's just asking about that second slot. He's looking specifically for Gen 2 by 4 SSDs, uh, but they're very expensive. And he's just asking what the difference is between those two slots and if it really is that significantly worse if he were to drop an SSD into it. I'll link you to a Tweaktown review. This is uh, by my boy Steve over there. So he always does a great job with those. Uh, but you can find, of course, pictures on here. And this is where I was just doing some double checking beforehand about the M.2 slots. This is the lower M.2 slot, and it shares bandwidth with this PCI Express slot, which is wired up, you can kind of see here, for by 4 So the PCI Express Gen 2 by 4 bandwidth of this PCIe slot will be diverted over to the M.2 slot if that is what you decide to populate. Now there's different ways of setting up a motherboard and different ways of wiring things, and you have PCI Express lanes that come directly from the CPU, and then you also have a chipset, which has a peripheral controller hub, and that has more PCIe lanes allocated to it, and it essentially acts as a switch. Now, I can't say this for absolute sure because I haven't looked at the actual block diagram of this motherboard, but I'm pretty confident that the PCIe Gen 2 by 4 connection from this motherboard is coming from the PCH, from the chipset, rather than directly from the CPU. That means that you might suffer from a little bit of latency problems with this, but then of course you also have the issue that it is PCIe Gen 2 rather than Gen 3, and uh, you can also check out the PCI Express page on Wikipedia, which I'll also link in the description if you want to check that out. It goes over lots of stuff like the pinouts and everything like that. But I want to scroll down to this chart right here because we can see the actual bandwidth that's available. With PCI Express, you have theoretical throughput or transfer rate, and that's in gigatransfers per second because it's bi-directional. And then you have actual throughput. How much performance can you actually get out of a device that's connected to this? And here we can see that with Gen 2 uh, by 4, you have 2 gigabytes per second, whereas with Gen 3, it uh, pretty much doubles to about 4 gigabytes per second. So going back to one of your original questions, is it worth it to invest in a PCIe Gen 2 by 4 SSD? No, it's not. Remember, PCI Express is backwards compatible. You can take a Gen 3 uh, M.2 SSD and slot it in there, and it will simply cap the bandwidth so you won't get the maximum amount of bandwidth. So all you have to do is check how fast the SSD is that you want to connect. The WD Black 500 gig is, is a very fast uh, M.2 NVMe SSD, 3,400 megabytes per second. So we can pretty clearly see here that if you were to plug that drive into a Gen 2 by 4 connection that caps at 2 gigabytes per second, you'd be significantly hampering the overall performance of this drive. And that is not even including, again, the potential little uh, latency hit that it might uh, see going through the PCH rather than directly to the CPU. Stepping back a bit though to answer your other question, which is why do they include these? Uh, well, specs on a motherboard are often a big selling point. And then also you could potentially get a less expensive SSD that slots in there and it would it does give you more bandwidth and more performance than a typical SATA connection. So I'd rather have it there than not, but I completely understand if you're a little bit confused as to those two slots and the difference between them. And I hope this explanation has helped you a little bit. My last questions here are in reference to last month. So uh, this is actually the last two months we've been talking about the difference between fan sizes. The key to air power here, which is a very appropriate name, is pointing out that my mat, my fan math is wrong because I, I did the dimensions of the fan itself a vertical, horizontal, getting the entire area here. What they're pointing out is if you really want to compare the difference between fan performance, you need to use pi and pi r squared. You need to use, you need to use some higher level math, which I can do, but not off the top of my head, to get the area of the fan, the circular area of the fan, and then you have to subtract the area of the fan hub, and that will give you the effective area of actual gap here that the fan is effectively pushing air through. So I appreciate that being pointed out as well. I think we have beaten that horse to death, so let's move on. But I do appreciate the, the, the clarification there. This one is about the migrating windows question that was asked last month, and I pretty much answered that by saying, I always do a clean install, that's my recommendation. But there is some more nuance to that, and Niall Pierce, who asked the question, was replying to B28, UB, B2B. And thank you to both of you for responding to each other and helping each other out. Also, Total Insanity 4 here, who is pointing out uh, Acronis, basically. An Acronis license is often included with an SSD. And if I am forced to do a migration, uh, an operating system migration from an existing drive over to a new drive, if I'm upgrading a, a system drive or something like that, Acronis has always been my go-to. It has worked most consistently for me so that is where I would direct you if you're looking to do an actual migration and then the other thing I was going to point out here just to follow up that as well if you have a hard drive an existing mechanical hard drive in your computer and that's what your operating system is running off of and you want to upgrade to an SSD 
do not use this method because there are differences with the actual Windows installation between a spinning mechanical hard drive and an SSD. You want to clean install on an SSD for the first time, so uh, don't use it in that situation. But upgrading an SSD, yes, and a Cronus is totally a viable option for you. Finally, James Fustin says, I watched this with some Sony 1000 XM3s on and couldn't hear Hero at all. This is a follow-up to last month's question about uh, the audio solution I've been using, so thanks to you guys for that. I have been using some of your suggestions for this past month, so we've been doing a little bit less background music when it's just me up here talking, and uh, hope you guys have appreciated that, and maybe it's improved things just slightly. One last thing to point out, guys, if you uh, watch our live show and you want to help send something in for me to open up live on the show during mail time, uh, Paul's Hardware PO Box 4325. Feel free to send me stuff. We open packages usually every two, three, four weeks on the live show, depending on how much stuff we have coming in. So thank you guys for your support. Thank you guys as well for watching this video. Hit the thumbs up button, and of course, leave me those comments in the comment section below for me to answer next month. We'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.